First of all, I wanted to thank you all for inviting me. Uh, it doesn't happen often that as a graphic designer interested in uh, the, the intersection between graphic design and free software, I find myself in a situation where that is uh, not an exception, but the norm. So thank you for that. Um, I will present, uh, as said, uh, a workshop that happened only a month ago. So. I apologize in advance, we're just processing uh, the results, so you will see uh, the stage of where we're in. As all of us, uh, as all of the designers do nowadays, they depend largely on digital tools to create their work. They operate on bits and, and bytes that can be potentially viewed, copied or published instantaneously and without loss. Their practice has become networked and distributed challenging conventional ideas about who might call herself a specialist and what counts as a professional job. Relations between users and producers have radically changed, or at least in theory. In a read-write world, a world where we can all have permission to view or make, make and change files, we can also have the right to link materials and learn from them. But designer tools suffer from overdetermined determined functionality and are full of assumptions about designers' practice and the world they function in. Designer tools are shaped by conventional models of production and distribution, conditioning our practice in terms of division of labor, vocabulary, and relation to the medium. While physical tools can be easily altered or combined with the help of some gaffer tape, software is much harder to penetrate, even more if it appears easy to use. On a technical level, but also legally, you're shielded off from tinkering with them, even if you use these tools every day to make your own work. It cuts designers off from a, an, a history of art filled with creative collaborations of many sorts and disconnects them from a long tradition of artists reinventing their tools. This explains why I find the lively culture... By the way, this is an homage to Douglas Engelbart, who passed away uh, uh, recently. So it's a work he made to experiment with writing. To, uh, writing. Um, this explains why I find the lively culture of development that grew out of the free software movement so inspiring. It sparked new tools informed by a new type of practice, collaborative, ready to show mistakes, process-oriented and iterative. The popularity of projects such as processing, open frameworks, image magic, Arduino, like we saw just now, uh, show how productive it can be to take technology out of the confined box of predefined applications. But this is not so obvious for more daily tools everyone needs for page layout, drawing, editing and writing. A full range of free software packages exist for this type of work, but more often than not, they follow the same paradigms as their proprietary mirror images, and we're only beginning to find ways to truly take part in their development. So this special edition of Interactivos, we wanted to explore how tools for creative work could adv uh, take advantage of the kind of multi-directional workflows for editing, designing, and drawing that have opened up. I'm, I'm like a, a bit mixed. Um, I don't really know if these visual changes are really something that will improve a designer's workflow. But I think because this is so attractive, um, uh, then designers will come to it saying, oh, let's try it. And then they will find out about versioning. And then they will find out about collaboration. And they will start working on collaboration. So, Interactivos, tools for a read-write world. Interactivos is a, is a method, is a way of working that exists uh, since 2006, and it's been developed by Media Laprado since then. Um, 
it's something that just is not just owned by them. Uh, it's also uh, been happening in other countries, uh, in Ljubljana, in Dublin, in um, Mexico City, uh, and, and in Lima, for example. So there's different places that this happens. Um, they follow more or less the same uh, idea. There's an open call uh, to which people can propose projects, and based on these projects, collaborators can uh, come forward and say, I want to come work on this. Um, they have been working on very evocative t themes, mostly related to hardware. Um, uh, for example, obsolete technologies of the future was a theme of Interactivos in Ljubljana. Magic and technology, for example. Uh, or garage, garage science, science, trying to think about science uh, outside of the academic institutions. The workshops are aimed at expanding the use of electronic and software tools for artists, but more importantly, I think they grow local and international communities of cultural producers. And that's a really an impressive part of the work. So what I'm showing you here is a, is a graph of the particular context that uh, this workshop took, pl took place in, because I think it's important to understand that around this idea of Libre Graphics, which is the, let's say, um, a name of choice for referring to a graphics that is firmly rooted into uh, uh, the ethics of free software. So it's a, it's a conscious so choice to not talk about open uh, graphics, but about legal graphics. Uh, so there's a whole uh, um, ecology of organizations, teams, people working uh, that uh, have somehow made possible the work that happened uh, in this edition. So as I said, uh, Interactivo starts from an open call, and this is just the introduction uh, that, to this call that we sent out. Media La Prado and the Libre Graphics Research Unit are looking for projects to be collaboratively developed during a two weeks workshop to be held in Madrid. We are interested in your ideas for tools to design, edit, draw, and write together. This edition focuses on reinventing a Libre Graphics workflow that supports collaboration and exchange. So you see how the theme uh, is closely related to the kind of network uh, or com uh, network of communities this was taking place. So the images are like the images we saw this morning of uh, very enthusiastic people uh, coming together uh, to work. Ten days, uh, usually long days, um, trying to uh, develop their, the projects that were selected, but also uh, on each other's projects, which was a very interesting to see. What was interesting in this specific edition that we changed some of, the, of the, the methodologies that had been somehow established throughout the experience of, I think in total now, 16 editions of this 10-day workshop. Uh, first of all, we, we decided to take uh, documentation really into the heart of the project, because it seemed logic that, that we would uh, somehow make space for that, not just as a, as a sort of... Pre, um, something that needed to be done um, uh, because of it being open, but also as part of the, the work we actually wanted to experiment on. So we decided to publish a fanzine while we were doing, developing, developing the project. And so when the workshop was over, we could uh, staple it and uh, hand it out. I'm sorry. Another thing that happened was, uh, and you, I think maybe you picked it up already in some of the uh, sound files I played to you, uh, was that uh, the, the sort of um, uh, reference to uh, version control, a, a collaborative platform for software development actually, started to become a sort of meme, a sort of uh, re uh, uh, reference to uh, the kind of work that was happening in the groups. Uh, here is a, a report from uh, a mini workshop that happened uh, by a group that was not at all interested in software. They were illustrators, uh, but uh, they were very interested in the ideas that were brought forward in this tool. This also branched out into the way uh, the, the, the uh, workshop was somehow uh, uh, documented at, uh, uh, on the spot. 
the advisor team decided to install this uh, daily commit log, which was basically uh, paper posters where e every group every day would give a short uh, report on what they have, had been doing. And a sort of social process of writing up what you've done next to the work of others created really many interconnections that otherwise, I think, would have been more difficult to, to make. The other thing that was used was an issue tracker, uh, again, a physical one in the space where people would, would post uh, the problems they were having and the solutions they might uh, come up with. And this, over the, the course of 10 days, was surprisingly uh, useful. So as I said, um, uh, this workshop is developed around an open, an open call. 70 proposals were made, uh, nine proposals were selected, uh, and based on these nine uh, proposals, uh, around 50 collaborators from all over the world came to work on these. And what I found interesting to see is that not only did they have very different backgrounds and came from different countries, but also that they had very different ages. So there were people just, uh, just 20, but also we had collaborators of 60 and 75. So that was really created a good dynamic to talk about this, these ideas. So I will quickly uh, present you the projects that were developed. Obviously, I can't do them just, justice, but I decided to show them all because I think the range, range of projects might be maybe more interesting at this point uh, than their specific work. All of them are currently still being developed. Uh, so if you are quick and you note uh, their URLs or come to me and look at this book, or look at Media Prado's website, they're really interesting to see also how they will develop from, develop from here on. So first project that was very, in, in some ways, straightforward, uh, and again connected to this, this idea of version control, was called Design with Git. Um, it was trying to find a solution to the problem that designers have when they use systems made for software development, that there's no such thing as an image in these kind of systems. And Julien de Soif, who proposed this project, was making a prototype on how you could actually have more, uh, let's say, meaningful uh, uh, visualizations of differences between uh, uh, the several versions. He just has a new version out. I... So here you see uh, these systems are actually made for uh, code differences that are not so meaningful. Uh, you want to see what changed in the image. Another project, we heard the voice of uh, uh, Dave Crossland earlier, uh, was again responding to a very specific uh, uh, need, um, real-time collaboration with FontForge. FontForge is a, a tool to do um, font development, so really to, to construct uh, typefaces. And I'll just show you a very short video. Okay, we're gonna demonstrate the real-time collaboration that. You'll see that as Edu and Anna edit the glyphs, that they're updated on this web page in real time. So there's that end moving. And there it is on the page. And then Anna's loading up her session again. She's opening up the J and shifting it, and you can see over on the web page over here a J shifting. Open source digital pattern making, uh, a very interesting response to uh, understanding pattern making nowadays as a digital. Uh, work, but at the same time seeing that the idea of body measures has not been taken into the way we make patterns, let alone that amateurs, people that want to make uh, patterns from them, for themselves or even want to do very small uh, clothing business, uh, have no tools actually to do that. So this is a group that developed uh, uh, an approach to that. El Recetario came from an interest in upcycling and recycling, and this group developed some recipes and prototypes for, for example, uh, reusing obsolete phone booths as, as public uh, libraries, uh, but also uh, redid their whole online structure uh, in these 10 days. 
Yes, now maybe more like a research project, but very useful in this uh, group of projects. I uh, wanted to ask about how decisions are actually coerced by systems. So how is the consensus forced by the way a system is set up, and how are, the collaborative, to how are collaborative tools actually um, uh, making, sp uh, could they make space for doubt and difference? So they went through a whole series of um, experiments with voting and uh, 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 time-based decision-making processes, and even the color of the of the um, uh, the the booklet was decided in a completely rigged uh, anti-democratic vote. Grappa is a, was a group that started, uh, that was basically more a, a network or a group of uh, Spanish-speaking uh, people interested in publishing and designing uh, and trying to think through tools and forms of, uh, let's say, how content could be different, differently published. They're still going strong. Collaboratorio de Relatos, uh, nine projects, it's not long, not nothing. Um, a group of illustrators, again, very interested in digital practice, but in them, uh, themselves much more comfortable with, with uh, pen and ink, uh, worked throughout the 10 days with other groups to somehow make images that would, would help uh, imagine uh, the kind of practices we were working with. So they developed a, uh, what they called a, a, a hack mythology, uh, so creating images that uh, would somehow um, show those kind of practices uh, with, uh, in another way. And also produced a set of fanzines. Last project I present is uh, freedom of the Freedom of Speech project that uh, developed a kit for freedom of expression. Uh, they were interested in these kind of situations and how, on the one hand, uh, you could mix, uh, let's say, dis um, distributed uh, protests, like uh, people not being able to go to the square, uh, but still wanting to send a message out on the one hand, and on the other hand, you could create solidarity between different groups uh, protesting on different places. So they devised uh, a kind of kit that you could carry that uh, uh, um, is energy autonomous, so it doesn't need, uh, you don't need to plug it, uh, can be constructed by people themselves with cheap materials, and then can be used to uh, carry messages in public spaces. Yeah, well, I mean, when you're using the internet and the, the social networks, you know, you you like in your computer and you display it there, and you don't know. I mean, there's no physical component. There's no environment. No, the environment doesn't matter at all. No? You can't explain it, but it's different when you're like in a physical context, and uh, and then you're relating to that one space and to the people around it. So this was Maria. That I think she's here somewhere. I can't see her, but. Uh, speaking about uh, uh, the reason for making a physical object that can be carried in public space. So, as uh, the keynote speaker this morning reminded us, uh, network technology is uh, very important, but it's more important that people start to act, and I think that's uh, really important to remember, because other collaboration, otherwise collaboration sharing and openness become, let's say, managerial issues and are not about the politics that they actually uh, uh, might make possible. So, to, in my mind, uh, the point of this kind of work and open design is to develop, design, and produce shareable content as a way to practice the potential of a read-write world. And digital tools, uh, so software functions as a kind of probe, as a sensor in this multi-way web of connections. Because you can really see how communication technologies, power, power structures, economies, all come together uh, on these places. To make our toolbox relate to the world in more interesting ways, I think we need to go beyond bug reports and feature requests, or even beyond swapping our, swapping our proprietary tools for ones released under free software. Developers, designers, hackers, and authors need to put their knowledge 
their skills and their experiences together so they can imagine future tools. And by doing that, it means that you might change your practice. And I think by changing our practice, we might change our world. Thank you very much.